being from Arkansas and knowing the audience that I'm in, I'll try to talk fast so that you can understand me. What's been going on? We, we've really known, how, you know, this whole idea of complete streets, it's really not new. Uh, Chief Cochran talked about how we, we kind of got, we were getting back to development patterns that we've done many, many years ago. We did complete streets. We did great streets as integral parts of great communities many, many years ago. What happened? Well, like John said, we had Miss, uh, Miss Concrete and Miss, Miss Blacktop show up, and, and we figured we had to build a whole lot of roads. But it was really more than that. We really started to get away from the idea of people, and we started focusing more on moving cars. How, do we, how would we actually move cars? So really our criteria became more about vehicle-centric uh, metrics, such as capacity, operational efficiency, What's the level of service and how can we minimize that delay? And as you can see, there were some unintended consequences. We really forgot all about moving people in many, many cities and, and with, many, uh, with many transportation facilities. We actually were prohibited in some cases and in some states from doing some of these things listed. I, I love the one where uh, at one point Florida Department of Transportation in the uh, late 90s was actually prohibited from building two lane roads. Any state road project had to be four lanes or more. So the DOT could not even build uh, two lane roads. Uh, like Ted alluded to earlier, uh, really what, what we espouse with Complete Streets is absolutely supported by, uh, by AASHTO and by our Green Book. However, we do try to, we have been trying to give more guidance and, and um, more guidance, more support to the engineering community through efforts such as the Walkable Urban Thoroughfares Manual, which actually does start to deal with looking at these specific contexts in, uh, in urban areas and how do we do these kinds of facilities? Uh, what are some of the things that we need to make sure happen? And this, this, this report really came about as a uh, as a result of the, the veritable cats and dogs uh, fighting, and uh, Congress for New Urbanism, Institute of Transportation Engineers were basically at loggerheads over the narrow streets issue. And they said, look, let's, let, let's try to understand each other's standpoint. The result of the three-year effort was this, uh, this document that now provides us a lot of guidance on how to actually do this. Uh, also very, very much context-based. What really are complete streets? In, in its simplest terms, complete streets are streets for everyone. We really look at them as part of the public realm, and we really want to facilitate movement of everybody. We want to make sure that we're moving people, not just cars. And so it almost starts to beg the question, what's the most road we can have here? Uh, it becomes a great question to, to ask ourselves as we start to look at, uh, look at design. It really goes further than that, though. It looks at this holistic transportation strategy where we're starting to look beyond the curves. What, what are we trying to achieve from a land use and development pattern, and what kind of facility supports and enables that vision rather than detracts from it? So we really want to make sure that we eliminate gaps. We're providing this seamless range of choices. Travel choices is really what it's all about so that people can walk. They can make a choice of walking, biking, uh, taking a bus, taking their car, and making sure they can switch between modes easily and without, without any network gaps. Relating it also to context. Understanding, uh, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Really understanding what, what's there. This final bullet point is probably one of the most important. We're not doing this in a vacuum anymore. We're inviting the public and, and our customers, if you will, into the kitchen to help us inform the design process and so their facility, we're designing facilities for the community, but also by the community. So built-in consensus building as well. Um, you may have seen this image before, but th this is, I, I call this the generica image. Uh, you know, this could be anywhere. This is actually US 301 in uh, the panhandle of Florida. But uh, you see the lonely guy there? Uh, you know, I'm sure that he would rather be somewhere else and would rather have a much easier crossing uh, than what he has. But really, this, was a, uh, this is a situation where if we start to separate the land use from the transportation facility, we can end up with these auto-dominated uh, types of corridors. 
So really, we do have to start to look beyond the curve and try to understand what, what we're trying to get. Understanding things like uh, enclosure ratios, really understanding the width of the road as compared to the height of the surrounding buildings uh, around it, so that people feel safer. They don't feel like they're on a landing strip uh, in these urban environments, that, that they really understand, and, and the vehicle's the same way, really uh, signaling to the motorist that it is more of a place for pedestrians, they should be more careful, they should expect those uh, pedestrians uh, as well. So while we talk about the travel way, we do realize that it is, uh, it does go beyond uh, the curbs uh, as well. So talk a little bit about context. What does context mean? It really means starting to match that facility to the area in which it occurs and making sure that what we're doing supports those uses, supports the mobility aspects and the desired mobility aspects uh, of that corridor. So as, uh, as new urbanists, we, bring it, we break it into this idea of transect zones, really looking at, as you move from more of a natural environment through rural into more urban, that the facilities, the development patterns start to focus on, uh, on being cohesive and concurrent with, with, those, with those different uh, transects and those different context zones. Um, and really understanding that block length becomes shorter, intersections become closer together. Uh, you're t you would expect more pedestrians, more cyclists, transit within the more urban context as well. Not to say that you don't have context sensitivity in a rural area, it's just that you're trying to coexist, more, uh, be more in harmony with the natural as opposed to the built environment uh, in urban areas as well. So when we start to translate that syntax down to streets and how, how we match street types to these places, we are specifically looking at placemaking. And therefore, we go beyond the functional classification of arterial collector uh, and local. We're actually using a syntax that's more based toward the street type and what kind of development it's supposed to support and what kinds of mobility aspects it's supposed to support. So we look, we, we look at things as boulevards, avenues, main streets, local streets, and even alleys uh, as well. And that doesn't have to be all of those breakdowns. Uh, we, can, we can add or subtract street types according to context or the specific jurisdiction. And, and some of the elements uh, fit in some of those contexts, some of them don't. We also don't forget about the street side, recognizing that the street and the right-of-way is all part of the public realm. We want to make sure that we're, we're furnishing the rooms on the street. So we have a room for cars, we have a room for we have a room for moving cars, we have a room for parked cars, we have a room for trees and shade, we have a room for people to walk, and we also have an amenity zone or another room for people to, uh, to dine or shop. Uh, and really all of that starts to create great places uh, as well. So one of those street side zones is kind of the walking zone. And you can see from the imagery some of the ways that, that that's accommodated. Uh, I want to call your attention to the, uh, to the lower left hand corner. No, that's not a mirror image. Those cars are really backed into an angle parking space. We find on street parking to be very helpful in separating uh, those zones, providing that buffer from the sidewalk and the, the walking traffic and the outdoor cafes from the moving, uh, from the moving vehicles. Um, in a lot of situations, we like to see angle parking on main streets. Uh, but I, I know that there are some issues with angle parking. We run into these all the time as our cars have gotten bigger and, they, and we have SUVs. As you're trying to back out, if you've got an SUV parked next to you, you can't see around the back of it. Uh, and, and so it's kind of a leap of faith to back out. One of the things that back end angle parking does is it starts to address that issue, that specific issue. You're looking over the hood of the adjacent vehicle rather than trying to look around the back end of it. We are seeing lots of jurisdictions doing this. Uh, some of the other advantages, if you're buying things, you're not standing in the street loading your packages into the trunk of the car. You're standing on the sidewalk loading your packages into the back of the car. And a personal experience from uh, a couple of months ago, um, your children, children in these cars, when the doors open, the doors are shepherding them or blocking them from running into the street, it's pushing them back toward the sidewalk. My hometown, we actually had an incident uh, about three months ago where a seven-year-old child, same age as my son, uh, got out of the car in an angle parking space, ran toward the street, was clipped by 
clipped by a car. It was rush hour, the, the vehicles were moving slowly, but that could have been prevented if that, if that configuration had been back in angle parking. So a lot, a lot of other advantages to doing that. Um, so if you're looking for some solutions for that angle parking dilemma, this could certainly be one of them. Charlotte Department of Transportation uh, near my hometown uh, actually mandates the use of back-end angle parking if a developer comes in and proposes angle parking in a development. We're seeing it more and more uh, as well. Been a lot of, uh, a lot of movement lately, uh, recently, on bike facilities. And these are things that uh, you know, the latest edition of the MUTCD has finally acknowledged the share of. And I, I don't know if you, you see it many sharrows around here, but the shared lane markings for bicycles. But um, they certainly didn't address some of the more European uh, facilities that, that, are, that are being seen, such as uh, cycle tracks, um, separated trails within the roadway. I, and I'll show a couple of examples of where that's being done in the U.S. So a lot of cities that were struggling with this, with this issue, got together they put together a set of design guidelines based on experiences from a lot of these cities that we're, we're doing. It's called the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide. If you haven't seen it, I would certainly uh, suggest that you look at it. And then I believe just earlier this week, AASHTO released their new bike design facilities. Uh, it was done by some of our colleagues in Baltimore, Tool, tool Design, um, that starts to pick up on a lot of the things from NACTO, bring them more mainstream into the uh, engineering community. Uh, as well. But we're seeing a lot more cycling, not necessarily for recreational use, but for uh, actual for transportation. People are, are using their bikes, they're finding it an efficient way, uh, means of transportation. It's cheap, it's easy. Uh, days like today, it's probably fairly wet to, to bike, but um, certainly people, are, people are, uh, are doing it. I'll share with you a latent uh, example of latent demand on that uh, shortly. From a vehicular standpoint, we don't want to forget about the cars. Um, you know, some, some people look at, our, look at the movement toward complete streets, it's like when you're taking room away from the cars, we're right-sizing for the cars. So we want to make sure that we offer those different mobility choices and, and so that people have viable choices as to what they do uh, and how they move about. Uh, I often joke that the you know everybody thinks engineering engineering is so math based, but yet the realm of traffic engineering two plus two does not equal four. A four lane road does not carry as much traffic as two two lane roads because as you start to get friction you're losing uh, you're losing lane capacity. So it's not directly proportional as you add lanes you're not doubling and tripling your capacity on that facility. Um, which is one of the reasons that looking at the, uh, the, the presentation earlier about the road diet, one of the reasons that a four-lane road or a three-lane can carry, um, in, in a lot of instances, a three-lane road can carry as much traffic as a four-lane undivided facility as you remove the left turns uh, and then on the, from the standpoint of safety it becomes much, much safer. Uh, not a lot of difference between lane width unless you start to go be below that 10-foot threshold. But there's a significant difference in the speed uh, as you go from a 10-foot lane or a 12-foot lane to an 11-foot lane to a 10-foot uh, to a lane. Really, from a pedestrian standpoint and even from a vehicular standpoint, your single biggest factor in the severity of, cra of a crash is the speed of the vehicles involved. Um, this is the speed kill slot. If you're walking and you're crossing a road and you're hit by a car that's doing 20 miles, 20 miles an hour, you have uh, an 85% chance of surviving uh, that accident. As that, uh, that collision, as that goes up to uh, 30 miles an hour, it's not proportional. You actually then have a 55% chance of surviving that collision. At 40 miles an hour, your survival chance only becomes 15%. So it becomes almost inversely proportional uh, as you as you start to move forward in that, and that's very similar to getting creamed by Usain Bolt at the finish line uh, of a sprint race, uh, standing in lane four. Uh, some of the other elements of complete streets, really looking at how we integrate medians, how we integrate landscaping, 
uh, and pedestrian crossings. Use of materials, use of planting materials, really enhancing that public realm. And these are areas that we can start to dovetail and uh, the presentation after this will start to talk about some of those elements where you can start to use low impact, innovative stormwater kinds of facilities utilizing the street space. One of the, one of the things that I, I like to talk about is think of your pavement, think of your existing pavement as an asset. And if you're a business, if you're a business and part of that asset isn't performing, you reallocate those assets. So it, road diets are very similar to taking that pavement you got pavement that's not doing not doing the job that it should be. You reallocate it to something else, uh, and really start to uh, rebalance that transportation system and offer more choices. Uh, some of the other things that, that we need to consider as we start to look at uh, complete streets: making sure we accommodate transit, uh, larger vehicles, emergency vehicles, like uh, Chief Cochran uh, pointed out. Are there opportunities to, uh, to do things with utilities? One of the things that we do in a lot of, we see here first and foremost in a lot of our downtown work, can we bury the utility lines? They're really ugly. Uh, are there opportunities as part of some of these projects to either bury or even relocate? A lot of times we can get, this, we can get the desired effect at a much less cost just by moving the utilities to the backs of the buildings, to alleys, moving them right off of, uh, off of the main street. How do we transition from context zone to context zone? or from transect to transect, and how do those gateways uh, and those transition zones work. Uh, access management, um, you know, planted medians are a great access management tool, and uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but good urban design actually accomplishes access management. We don't want to see driveways uh, at every parcel. We would love to see either rear access uh, or access off of the side street thereby also accomplishing the goal of eliminating conflicts along your main route as well. Understanding maintenance, uh, maintenance agreements, we work with a lot of communities that with departments of transportation, they do joint maintenance agreements uh, for some of these elements that may be a little non-conventional. Non uh, and finally, wayfinding, really understanding uh, how people get into, uh, uh, get into a district and move around and helping them find their way because wayfinding for vehicles is much different than for someone on foot. Uh, don't forget, at some point, every motorist becomes a pedestrian. So when we put all of those elements together, we can end up with really, really great streets. If you look at this street, this is from uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, and, you know, a very nice looking street. Um, this road at peak hour is completely level of service F vehicular level of service F, but the rest of the day it can be very, very good for all users. Uh, plenty of access uh, and, and very attractive, aesthetically pleasing, and a good place for business and for people to walk. So complete streets really do start to focus on the context. We want to make those connections, not just uh, roadway connections, not just making sure we have a connected network, but also connected modal networks, eliminating those gaps between people walking and riding a bus, between people in their car uh, and wanting to take a bike somewhere. Um, simple things such as putting bike racks on your uh, buses and your, uh, and your trains. Uh, zip bikes or uh, bike share are certainly ways to, to enhance that, uh, that kind of movement. And then dovetailing some of these, uh, some of these elements, uh, you see the image from Portland of the rain garden that also doubles as a pedestrian bump out. So really thinking about all those street components, thinking beyond the travel lane. So complete streets policies. Uh, almost 300 jurisdictions now have complete street policies. Uh, I believe it's uh, 25 states plus uh, Puerto Rico and DC also have policies. Uh, and and these, these are all the, the places that have done that. Uh, you'll see in, in the Northeast, uh, many, many, much uh, attention being given to this subject, both at a local and a state, uh, and a state level as well. The greens are very interesting because those are the places that, that have adopted, not only adopted policies, but they've also done design manuals or guidelines uh, for implementation of complete streets. So, uh, and that, that becomes very, very important. So whenever you start to look at developing a complete streets policy, you know, you wanna make sure that, that you understand the why, uh, the what, which is the all users, 
and what it, the kinds of things that it applies to. Uh, does it apply to new facilities or uh, retrofit? The answer there is it needs to apply to all. And uh, we need to make sure that, that we allow flexibility, calling out the design guidelines uh, that could be done. And also, what are those next steps? Because adoption of a policy is a first step. There's still work to be done, as I'll point out. Um, from the local level, making sure that, that all of the comp plans, the multimodal transportation plans, and any of your neighborhood small area corridor plans can, can grab onto those and espouse those, uh, those principles of complete streets and be in adherence uh, with that as well um, is very important. The next step is really to examine, uh, examine your regulatory framework. And this is very important on a state level to really understand what, uh, what needs to be done with your engineering and design manuals. It's also important on a local level. Um, a lot of communities are adopting either form-based codes or unified development ordinances that start to look at things like setting street typologies, setting cross-sections uh, as development and redevelopment occurs. Uh, you see the uh, form-based codes are cert uh, in the upper right, certainly a gaining a lot of momentum around the country. We've got some very, uh, a lot of successful implementation of those kinds of codes uh, being done. But also making sure that we assess, we continually assess and modify and really understanding what the performance is, uh, being able to evaluate how we're doing. City of Raleigh, North Carolina just adopted a unified development ordinance. They immediately followed that with a comprehensive rewrite of their engineering design manual that governed their streets, their sidewalks, driveways, and access. So again, it's not just enough to, to look at uh, that development policy, but really understand all the tendrils that feed into that and everything that's affected and make sure that we, we have a complete understanding so that policies uh, and principles can be implemented and are not blocked by some piece of outdated uh, regulatory legislation. Um, and as you see, some of the there's ranges given in some of the tables uh, as well. So I'm going to tell you a tale of two different states, uh, neighbors to the north and south, uh, my home state of North Carolina and our neighbor to the south, South Carolina. Um, these examples illustrate the importance of not just adopting a policy. Uh, anybody from South Carolina in the room, I apologize in advance for, uh, for, for what I'm about to say, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. South Carolina DOT in 2002 rolled out an engineering directive, a complete streets policy, and immediately started waving their hands and saying, look, we're one of the first ones in the country to do this. You can't do complete streets on a state road in South Carolina. South Carolina DOT never revisited their design guidelines. They never rewrote their manual. This is a cover of, of the basically the Bible of design for on state roadways in South Carolina, uh, which is affectionately known as the arms manual. And the arms manual prohibits most things that make really good complete streets. And it, it really is much more of a one-size-fits-all uh, kind of approach in that clear zones don't take into account uh, speeds or, um, or the context. Uh, more importantly, don't take into account the context of a certain area. So a road that you design through downtown uh, Greenville or Columbia can, must look very similar to one that you do in rural South Carolina. One size fits all. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to trying to change the uh, change what's going on there. Um, we're going to keep fighting. We haven't had ter a terrible, terribly lot of success, but uh, certainly the state is aware of it, uh, aware of the issues, and uh, hopefully something will happen soon. Looking at the neighbor to the north, North Carolina DOT was very um, was was very late to the party in adopting their complete streets policy. They didn't do theirs until three years ago, 2009. However, immediately upon adoption of that policy, the governor and the secretary of transportation convened a task force to do a comprehensive rewrite of their design guidelines to address 
where it, where those could be, uh, where complete streets could be done, and what those design elements should be in those contexts where you wanted to do complete streets. Uh, those final guidelines are now under review. Uh, the state's actually testing some of those guidelines, uh, whereas uh, two years ago, uh, it was basically a mandate that North Carolina DOT on a state road would not drop a lane width below 11 feet. Uh, they now have in their guidelines 10 foot lane width as a minimum for certain contexts. And that, that's part of the part that's important is that they started to look at the area in which those roads would go through. North Carolina is a little different, not to the level of Virginia where even cul-de-sacs are state roads, but North Carolina carries uh, most of the lane mileage is within the state system, even down to local roads. Um, there are lo local uh, or city, local municipalities can have jurisdiction over some facilities, but for the most part, most of your main streets in smaller towns in North Carolina are state highways. So the DOT really was, was very good at looking at those contexts, understanding what those zones would be outside and behind the curb as well as within the curb lines themselves. So looking at what kind of development was likely to take place, where you might have some green space, and using that also uh, for stormwater, uh, and then really started to function on these different uh, these different elements as they develop cross sections. Uh, had some imagery that illustrated the different concepts of the uh, of the different elements, whether they be bike lanes, transit lanes, uh, planting zones, um, or, or sidewalks uh, as well. And then look, they and then as you see, they they articulated that more to engineering guidelines, looking at the different ranges, uh, and the ranges are important, uh, looking at the different ranges of widths for all of the different elements. So for instance, uh, in a central business district, um, 10 to 13 foot, uh, 10 to 13 foot lanes, depending on whether it was a shared condition with bicycles, uh, wider sidewalks, really understanding what that separation zone was, uh, applicable on areas for on-street parking or transit, and really looking at it all in the context of building face to building face uh, as well. They have done a, uh, in my opinion, they've done a very, very good job. What to take away from that really is, is the fact that complete streets policy, it's a good start, but it is a start. We've got to make sure that we revise, uh, that we review and revise our guidelines to allow them to be implemented where we want those kinds of streets to be implemented. Uh, a lot of education that needs to be done as well, both the professional community and also with public stakeholders uh, to, to get people behind that. And then also to really develop that strategy for implementation. How do we get there? How do we get these things on the ground? So we can create really, really great streets, but uh, how do we pay for them? And uh, this is part of the uh, part of the commercial for the third workshop uh, to be held in the fall. Uh, that's going to talk a little bit about funding, but just a uh, just an overview, really quickly. One of the things that, that we see, and one of the strategies that we're see that that we use in redevelopment and uh, urban planning, is that we want to target public dollars, public investment dollars. We want to make sure that we make those investments in infrastructure where we get the most return from private reinvestment within a community. So we're using those public initiatives as leverage. Create that place where people want to be, people want to locate, generate economic development. Uh, I'll tell you a story of a, a couple of cities and where, where this is actually happening. Number one is in Memphis. Uh, a lot of people don't think of Memphis, Tennessee as the hotbed, one of the hotbeds of the complete streets movement. It absolutely is. Uh, it's being recognized more and more as well, and Memphis is in a very similar financial situation to a lot of cities in that they don't have a lot of money to do this. Uh, they had had the same administration, same mayoral administration for 26 years. Four years ago, whenever Mayor Horton came into office, he said, you know, it's really, it's really uh, sad that this year in 2008, we were voted one of the 10 worst cities for cycling in the nation by Bikes Belong. They were also rated as one of the 10 most obese cities in the country. Uh, maybe some correlation there, but Mayor Horton said, you know, within four years, we're going to have 55 miles of dedicated bike facilities. 
And we're going to start with this segment out by Shelby Farms where we have a six and a half mile uh, rail corridor and we're going to build this green line. And that's what we're going to do to springboard this program. Nobody realized how much of a latent demand there was for cycling. This is a 10 foot wide trail that has traffic jams on it on weekends. Uh, absolutely a, a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. But they didn't stop there. Uh, they're looking at extending uh, the Green Line uh, on its western terminus to connect to their um, Crown Jewel City Park of Overton Park. Those of you that were, uh, are, are familiar with NEPA might recognize the name Overton Park as the birthplace of the NEPA legislation. It's the only gap in Interstate 40 from coast to coast, uh, birth the NEPA legislation. Uh, but the, the facility now stops uh, at the bottom right of, the, uh, of this photograph and they're looking at doing uh, a connector to the park from the end of the Green Line into Overton Park. Um, what they wanted to make sure they did was connecting their assets. And Memphis has a very active uh, private philanthropic community that's very behind this initiative. But they really wanted to look at how do we connect, how do we connect the end of the trail into the park and let people think that they've never left the trail even though we're carrying them over the road. So the way they did that is this is through the Broad Avenue uh, Arts District. Uh, had a very large, uh, large road through this, uh, through this part of the community. Had a few businesses that were starting to come in. Uh, and you'll see this buffered bike lane. This is what's called a guerrilla road diet. The merchants along here convinced the city to let them road diet the road with paint as a revitalization effort. And then they held an event called New Face on an Old Broad where they set up false storefronts. They had a big art festival. And uh, supposedly all this paint was temporary. Uh, but two years later, the paint is still there. Um, the, the district has seen a lot of interest and a lot of redevelopment, a lot of new businesses go in, and they're not stopping. They wanted to really bring a high level, uh, a high level type facility to make that connection. And again, designing for that lowest common denominator of user, uh, like, like whenever I'm biking with my, with my burly trailer and my four year old behind me, be able to come off the green line, go to Overton Park and never feel like I've left the trail. What, uh, what, what, what they've come up with, they're going to do a cycle track, a two-way cycle track to make that connection. It's actually going to be separate, physically separated from the travel lanes, uh, provide streetscape, uh, also provide areas for uh, stormwater uh, mitigation, and that's what it looks like. They're moving forward with this. Uh, the city that in 2008 was voted as one of the 10 worst cycling cities in the country uh, was four weeks ago awarded a grant from uh, Bikes Belong, the very agency, the very uh, organization that told them they were one of the 10 worst in 2008, uh, among six, one of six cities to be awarded technical and financial assistance for their dedication in moving forward with these kinds of facilities. Zero to hero. They're, that's not all that they're doing there either. They're, uh, they're extending their green line four and a half miles out to the east, so they're moving east and west uh, as well. Comprehensive road diet program. Uh, looking at, this is a four to three um, on Madison Avenue to get bike lanes. They've done about 70 miles of facilities with another 200 on the book that they're doing through regular resurfacings. They're evaluating every corridor that's up for resurfacing, figuring out if they can add, uh, add bike lanes uh, when they're being done. The proof in the pudding is the, uh, is the upper right hand. You see the bike chained up to the business. So uh, they, the cycling community there has, been, uh, has responded by patronizing uh, all of the businesses there. This is one of the most exciting developments. This, this could be a game changer for them as well. This is the Harahan Bridge Project. You see these roadways. Uh, these were, this was a 1912 steel truss railroad bridge that was um, about halfway through the design of this, they decided they needed a vehicular connection, so they stuck these cantilever decks off to the side, decked them with wood, and you had one vehicle lane in each direction going across the Mississippi. 
harrowing experience. So this is really going to be for thrill seekers uh, and, and really a, more of a, uh, an attraction, but it's going to connect two co the two communities on either side of the river. Uh, we'll connect Arkansas to Tennessee and allow people to walk and bike across the, uh, the Mississippi River as well. Where's the money coming from? Well, the road diets, the, the biggest part of the road diets have been accomplished through ARA funding and through their regular resurfacing. The Green Line extension was part of a CMAC grant uh, and, and is being funded through City Match. Overton Broad Connector, the cycle track, to this point has been 100% privately funded. Uh, Livable Memphis is a, a, a nonprofit who has been collecting donations and been paying as they go along, uh, and they are still pursuing other grant opportunities. You see the money that they got from uh, the money and the assistance they got from Bikes Belong uh, for the cycle track as well. My final bullet is wrong. As of yesterday, uh, they, they were pursuing a Tiger IV. They won a Tiger IV for the Harahan Connection. $14.9 million to make the connection across the bridge. Successful as of yesterday. Zero to hero. Cities that are doing this don't necessarily have to be big. Uh, these are some images from Chief Cochran's hometown uh, of Russellville. We've had the good fortune of uh, working with Russellville. Um, it's almost a perfect storm. We've got Chief Cochran, who's a Congressman New Urbanism member and advocate of Narrow Streets, one of the, uh, one of the primary uh, groups that we would come up against uh, would be uh, emergency services. We have him as an advocate. The city engineer there is also a Congressman New Urbanism member and very, very into complete streets. So we, we definitely have uh, a lot of advocates and a lot of a lot of potential for doing uh, really, really great things. They're moving very, very fast. They completed a downtown master plan in January. Uh, on the heels of that charrette, we identified um, several initiatives. One is on Main Street to road diet US 64 and Main Street as it comes through downtown. Four to three road diet, converting their existing head and angle parking to back and angle parking and a high level of streetscape, facilitate a walkable environment. Um, they had a $250,000 enhancement grant from Arkansas Highway to actually kickstart some of the streetscape on Main Street. They were able to parlay that into taking some, one of the elements of the Main Street proposal, doing the bulb out, the planted bulb outs uh, that would also accommodate back end angle parking in the future. The bulb outs were designed to be able to accommodate either configuration of the angle parking. Uh, those design plans actually were submitted yesterday to Arkansas Highway, and that project will be bid sometime in the fall. So they're, they're going to have this done uh, within, probably within the next year. Uh, also as part of that was a corridor plan, and this is their first complete streets retrofit project. This is taking the star at the north is Arkansas Tech University, connecting down El Paso Avenue, two-lane neighborhood uh, character street, uh, across a floodplain and into downtown. Uh, the desire there, being near the university, was to enable uh, more high density student type housing uh, along there, very similar to what's being done at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. So as part of, uh, part of that downtown master plan and that concept, concept was developed to develop a cycle track on El Paso, utilizing rain gardens in the, separ in the uh, separators from the travel lanes and uh, narrowing travel lanes providing streetscape and uh, accommodation of pedestrians. Um, in working with them, we, we discovered that if we didn't move the center line, they could maximize their dollars, so we ended up converting the two-way cycle track concept to one-way. Uh, you'll also notice the cars parked in the, uh, in the divider between the cycle track and the roadway. The 12-foot separator is a placeholder because at uh, some point in the future, should those properties redevelop along the roadway, that developer could come in and cut in on-street parking, parallel on-street parking within that separator. Uh, not to be constructed immediately, but uh, could, be, uh, could be constructed in the future. So where's that money coming from? Uh, again, the $250,000 for implementation on Main Street is coming from a uh, streetscape enhancement grant. Russellville has a dedicated local option sales tax. We're starting to see that in a lot of communities uh, during these uncertain funding times. Uh, and then they're also doing a lot through repaving as well. So some of the benefits 
you know, road diets, complete streets, all have these economic benefits. Slab, the bottom bullet point's important. Uh, as you reduce speeds, property values can increase. Makes it a better place for people to walk. Um, things such as one-way to two-way conversions, adding on-street parking, uh, streetscape, can start to, it's not the magic bullet that revitalizes the community, but you're setting the table. It's that targeted uh, public investment to leverage uh, reinvestment in the community. Some of the funding sources available, you'll see the acronym here, OPM. Everybody likes to pay for these things with OPM. Other people's money. Um, we have an upcoming Surface Transportation Authorization Act. It's probably going to happen after the election in uh, November. Um, some of the, the ch community challenge grants that are still coming online and TIGER will what is likely to continue but it may be rolled into the Transportation Act. Uh, funding through, through EPA grants for green infrastructure and brownfields remediation can be used for planning and implementation as well. On the local side, things like tax increment, uh, business improvement districts, voter approved bonds or uh, local option sales taxes. CMAC and enhancement grants for, uh, for communities that are eligible, and don't neglect the private foundations such as Bikes Belong, Kodak American Greenways, and others, uh, other private foundations uh, in every community. Give you a quick word on Tiger. This is probably a little outdated as, as the announcements have been coming in yesterday, but it still holds true. Tiger 1234, 20% match in an urban area is not going to win a Tiger grant. Most of these projects have upwards of 50, 60% matching funding. Um, but they also need to be pretty much ready to go. Uh, bike ped projects usually should be coupled with something else. So it's a great source of money for transformative projects when you've done all your homework. Um, some other key points on funding, partnerships, looking at municipalities, local option sales tax can, is considered a local match because it's locally uh, generated dollars. Beaufort, South Carolina, and doing their Boundary Street, if they want a Tiger Three for their Boundary Street program, uh, their match money is primarily through their local option sales tax. Money was generated locally, they can use it to match for federal funding. And in most cases, on these larger grants, you may receive less than you request initially. Again, understand that it's leveraging uh, and, and uh, look, continuing to look for other sources. How do you start? Pilot projects. Somebody's not really sure of what, what it is, give them something they can look, see, feel, and experience. Uh, phasing implementation, certainly. Uh, you can do certain things through, uh, through restripings very easily. Memphis is doing their cycle track in two phases. The first phase is going to be a simple, simple uh, overlay and restripe of the roadway. They're going to come back in when they have more money available and actually put the islands and the streetscape in. Uh, and then start to get organized. Understand what that, res what that resurfacing program is. Start to earmark projects that you want to uh, that you want to be able to accommodate these kinds of facilities. Tag things that might be eligible for road dives so that when it does come up on the list, you're ready to go uh, as well. And if you have other improvements going on, whether from a private standpoint or the public standpoint, couple those uh, couple those those kinds of improvements and really start to leverage. Um, leverage those investments. With that, I'd love to entertain any questions that you have and I thank you for your time.